Hello, we are live on Alan Real here with uh, uh, someone who is n no stranger to this YouTube channel. I've had him on, I think, three or four times. Uh, he's a very knowledgeable Catholic. Uh, his name is Timothy Flanders. He runs the website Meaning of Catholic.com, which has great content. So if you want some good content, go to Meaning of Catholic.com. Uh, he's also um, he's published a book on interpreting scripture. And um, yeah, yeah. He, He's done a lot of work, but he's currently w working on a book. It's in its final stages. It'll be published soon. I, I, I've had a chance to uh, read an early draft of the book. And, um, and, and yeah, our good friend Timothy is going to talk about it. Timothy, how are you? Oh, Jesus is king. Doing well. How is uh, Western Canada treating you? Are you guys well, uh, locked down still over there? Uh, the lockdowns are largely l l lifted for, for now. Like, um, like, but the thing I'm more concerned about is that we're finally past that horrible heat wave, that heat wave that was in the oh, Northwest. Oh yeah. It hit that Northwest area. Right? United States also hit us. Right. So like, I'm glad that's over. It's still hot here cause it's summer, but nothing compared to what we had a couple weeks ago. So I'm, I'm glad that's over. The usuals are in the chat. We got John Fisher, Kyle, a few others. Uh, okay. So let's get to your book. Now, this I'm really excited about. Um, first of all, before we get to your book, um, just give us, I, I, I know we have an entire v v video on this and I encourage people to go watch it, but just give maybe a two minute summary of your faith journey, how you came to know the Lord Jesus Christ and ended up in the Catholic church. Yeah. Well, my, my book is actually, I decided to dedicate it to my parents who are Protestant, but they, they are pious Protestants as far as Protestants go. And uh, so they taught me to, as I say in the book dedication, call upon the holy name of Jesus. And uh, so they taught me that and they baptized me. Um, and so I grew up as a pious Protestant and... Um, but it was an evangelical Lutheran church, so it was um, high liturgically, somewhat high compared to most Protestants, but um, more evangelical in terms of mm, more doctrine, uh, less less readings from Luther, if you know what I mean. Um, but I became a, a Baptist when I was in high school, fiery Baptist against the Catholics, and um, went through a lot of searching through Protestantism, but basically it was the fundamental problem was that um, it was a crisis of history, really, because there's mm. just not really, it doesn't make sense that our religion was founded 500 years ago. It doesn't make sense. And so there's just something historical that doesn't add up and it never really added up. And it, I eventually was, I was very much into Messianic Judaism for a while because no. of its claims to be historical, claims to be basically the early church which I think are, are very, um, they're in some ways, they're a little bit more rational than the Protestants in some ways, because they at least can trace things or at least attempt to trace them back to the beginning. Um, and then eventually I was Eastern Orthodox, which was the closest really you can come um, to being the true church. Uh, and I think, um, and then ultimately I became Roman Catholic, but I think overall it was very much a crisis of history because so much of all of those movements are really based on historical claims. Uh, even the Protestants are claiming that they're restoring something ancient. So they're still making this historical claim. And I think more as I just continue to read history and continue to study things, I just found that there was so much false history. And I think especially among the Eastern Orthodox, there's really the most compelling false history. Uh, the most deceptive false history is really among the Eastern Orthodox because they have so much truth to what they're saying that it's very convincing to uh, many Catholics, actually. And so unless you have, you've studied all these different sort of aspects and schools of orthodoxy within the Orthodox churches, it's difficult to even pick up on what's going on there. It's a very, it's a very deceptive sleight of hand and may not even be a malicious on their part, but uh, the, many of them even believe this. So, um, I wrote this, I wrote this book to be 
it was an attempt, among other things, to create a one volume, a one volume history for the laity, which just kind of breaks down and tries to dismantle a lot of the myths that are out there um, and tries to do it in just a really like a really quick one volume summary for the average layman. And it's really the summation of, uh, I guess over a decade of research. Cause I, I was able to just bring, bring together all these different things that, um, I've learned over the years, I guess. And, um, I was like, for example, I was bringing in things I had translated back in, in college before 2010. I mean, so it was, it was a good experience that was very much the culmination of my my conversion actually it's just sort of personally speaking it's not really in the book that way but um it's very much autobiographical in terms of my intellectual journey i guess so um there's also a great deal in this book that also is, is passed over even by catholic historians uh for example the syriac churches and and the syriac history is very very unknown to many unfortunately and there's still even a lot of false history written by Catholics, I think, like I brought the Greek schism and whatnot. So, um, but ultimately, uh, sort of after I came to Rome, I, I, I actually came to Rome a few months after Pope Francis was elected. So I've been a Catholic under Pope Francis since he was elected and that's been it. And, um, I wrote a, I wrote a text, I think to not a, <laughs> not a, not a, cell phone text but a an article i wrote an article for one peter five like two years ago and it was a it was called uh i converted something like i converted to catholic church under pope francis from eastern orthodoxy and i don't regret it and that's still true i i just i've been under pope francis for uh what now eight coming on eight years um yeah it was eight years this year wasn't it yeah and, yeah that's a that, yeah. that's a good article by the way Thanks. I would really um, recommend everyone check that one out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, yeah. So essentially, so then within the Catholic stream, I've sort of been working on the, the current crisis that we face as Catholics. And I've also found a lot of false history there, I think, um, in, in my humble opinion, which I put in this book, which is that there's basically these two different sort of sides of, of Orthodox Catholicism. There's sort of the trad side, and then there's the sort of the John Paul II side, if you will. And they're they're still they're both kind of telling a half truth story about kind of the past 200 years, I think. Mm. At least many of many of the popular, not not necessarily scholars on both sides, but uh, much of the popular discourse among lay people. I mean, this book is really for the lay people. It's not necessarily for just the academics to talk about. But um, so I think that there's a lot of just oversimplification. Uh, I think people just want, they want an ideology or they're maybe even, they are maybe even fed an ideology when they read history. Um, and, but that's not history. History is usually far more complex than yeah. sort of an ideological oversimplification. And so I, I this book is basically kind of challenges every, every ideology that I sort of came across over these years, studying all these things. And that includes the current debates among Catholics. So that's the gist of the book. That's kind of a secondary goal, I guess, because the primary goal is is more about synthesizing um, culture and everything. And we can get into that. But um, that's sort of a, a secondary goal that I, it was sort of autobiographical in a sense. So um, you, heard it, <laughs> you heard it here, I guess. I, I've never shared that part of it. So that's it. Oh, well, uh, just a quick question. Uh, you. you, you are still Protestant or are they still L Lutheran? Uh, so they, they're basically evangelical Lutheran. And what that means is they're evangelical. Um, there's to, for anyone who's not familiar with the Protestant churches as they are today, there's essentially nobody is an actual Protestant anymore. Uh, it doesn't yeah, exist. What I mean by that is somebody who reads Luther, reads Calvin and holds to the, 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 whatever, whatever those, those dark, whatever their um, synod of Dort and all these confessions that they had. Nobody, nobody believes that anymore. Very few mm -hmm. Protestants actually believe. Not even Dr. Protestant. Cooper. I don't know. Maybe, I don't know who's, who's who, you know, in the Protestant world these days, but very few in terms of the mass of Protestants, the, like the millions of Protestants throughout the world, 
especially in America. I've, I've traveled quite a bit in America, American Protestantism. I've been abroad in abroad Protestantism. And there's basically evangelicalism is the dominant form of Protestantism, which comes out of the pietism of the 19th century, which is basically just de-emphasizing all doctrines, except for some very basic, like you must believe in Jesus Christ, you know, or maybe three more doctrines. That's pretty much, they disagree on basic stuff like baptism. So anyways, if somebody is an evangelical Lutheran, it just means that they go to a Lutheran church, but they're basically an evangelical. Um, there's only a few Lutherans who are still Lutheran these days. Yeah, I kind of like bringing up uh, that m most practicing Protestants in the world today, like practicing ones, like not nominal ones in England who are just baptized or nominal ones in Sweden who are, but practicing ones who go to church every week, go to churches that are less than 100 y y years old in terms of, of c c creation. And I see a tiny bit of a comeback of the traditional stuff. Someone like Jordan Cooper is trying to re revive, you know, traditional L Lutherism, uh, I, I know my friend for Father James, uh, he's an Anglican priest, part of the Reformed Episcopal Church, but pretty much those groups are, are very small, very small. Like the vast majority of the people are part of these evangelical, you know, rock band church that where the service looks more like a rave than a uh, um, liturgy, how it's supposed to be, because the church has always been liturgical both Old Testament and the New Covenant. Um, so uh, one of the things I found fascinating about your book, because like, like you covered the Greek and the Latin culture pre-Christianity, and that I didn't know a lot about, but I do know a lot of church history. And so in terms of the church history stuff, I probably knew 98% of what you put out, but the... Th the things you discovered and how you put them together was just brilliant, especially the part about the Pontifex Maximus. Uh, do you want to talk about that a bit? Yeah, I was an interest. I didn't realize that either. That was, a, that was something that came out of um, the research. And um, because I, I never really, I, I mean, the light bulb for me as an Eastern Orthodox was reading Vlad Vladimir Slovyev, Russia and the Universal Church, because there was something, there was just something off about Eastern Orthodoxy. And it's like, it's got all the bells and whistles. And there was some internal, I was a part of the Antiochian Orthodox Church of, of North America. And there was some internal struggles that were happening with our own bishop between the bishop and uh, the patriarch uh, in Antioch. And very long story short, there was just something that didn't seem right about it. And when I read Soloviev, it was like everything came together suddenly. And I realized what was really going on in the history of the, the seven ecumenical councils. And Soloviev is the first one that I've read to articulate the fact that all of these heresies are essentially means by which Pag the pagan Roman Empire was attempting to resist conversion, to convert all, all of them, all of their uh, pagan uh, morals and politics and everything into cr the Christian Church. And so, because the Roman civilization was such a great civilization, really the greatest pagan civilization in the history of the world, that's why our our God chose that time to be incarnate. And so in the fullness should, of time, exactly. Yeah. We should expect, we should expect the fiercest resistance. And I think uh, what I discovered was there were all these pagan elements from pagan religion, which had been sort of transferred into the uh, Eastern Orthodox uh, schism in various ways. So one of these is the, uh, I, I just had a long, I had two shows on Reason and Theology to explain this in more detail, um, but we'll just break it down briefly right here, is that the there's always been an idea of the sacred king or the sacred emperor, because in various societies, 
the king is just trying to take over and uh, assure his own power. So he has to take over the religion to justify and rationalize his own power. And in the Greco-Roman Empire, this happened with Caesar Augustus, who made himself the Pontifex Maximus, which was the, the high priest. So this he was the high priest of the Roman religion, which was essentially a, a just a, a, a curation of, of all the gods, essentially, just sort of uh, adding more gods to the pantheon and creating new cults and new altars for the new gods. So the Roman Empire would basically conquer a nation, and then they would just sort of adopt their gods, as long as they were basically more or less civil with their religion. They didn't like some of the crazy people, you know, doing crazy cultic stuff, but they would have basically uh, like the, the cult of uh, Artemis Ephesia, which was another big discovery for me in this research. That was an amalgamation of old, like uh, Egyptian Isis and the, the, the Anatolian uh, goddess worship and uh, Diana and Artemis. And they were all kind of amalgamated into one big goddess worship that was both virgin and mother. And this was the type, sort of this pagan type, that typology that Our Lady actually takes over at the Council of Ephesus. Um, but the Pontifex Maximus was the high priesthood of the Roman religion. And so there was this very, very strong concept of the sacred emperor as a priest. There is a priesthood of the emperor began, begun under Caesar, Caesar Augustus. And then there is also the personification of the Roman Empire itself in the goddess Roma. So it's kind of like what we have in America where we have Lady Liberty, who is actually, the, the Statue of Liberty is actually a Roman goddess named Libertas. That's exactly what it is. It's just wow. called something new. So it's actually a, a pagan goddess. But it's a similar thing that we have essentially, um, we have a goddess worship and we personify it as this eternal uh, American empire. Uh, as Abraham Lincoln said, uh, government for the people by the people shall not perish from off the earth and all this uh, nonsense about eternal uh, earthly kingdoms. They had the same thing in Greco-Roman Empire and it was called Roma, the goddess Roma. So the Pontifex Maximus was this high priest who was the sacred emperor. And then there was the worship of goddess, who is the goddess of Roma, who is this eternal goddess. And uh, in the West, this was utterly repudiated by St. Augustine in his work, City of God Against the Pagans. And that's the, that is the first and most important history that I based my book on, um, is this important synthesis of, of the sacred history of the, of the Holy Scriptures, which come, utterly repudiates all Roman religion and the, these concepts. And that's why it never really grew up in the same way as it did in the East, because they never had such a father who wrote such a work as City of God Against the Pagans. They had a Christianized Roma, which came out of Eusebius especially, uh, which was essentially identifying the Roman Empire in the East, sometimes called the Byzantine Empire. I, I've refrained from using the term Byzantine Empire because I think that term should be not used at all. Um, the the so-called Byzantines never called themselves Byzantines in yeah, their entire true. history. Yeah. Uh, so there's no... Yeah, I, I think that... I Edward... King Kibben, I think he's the one who slapped that name on there. If not, he popularized. Um, yeah, I don't know. It was some Western Latin uh, histor history historian who started calling them Byzantines. Mm. Uh, but yeah, one of the things was trying to, I think, change a lot of the pejorative historical terms. Uh, like we should, we should never use the term enlightenment. That's, that's a completely no, false yeah. term. We should use the yeah. term darkening or age of false reason or something like that. I anyway, th I think, I think GK Chesterton, didn't he call the, I don't know. You broke it, broke up a little bit. What was that? GK oh, Chesterton uh, called it. What the, uh, in the darkenment, the, the in darkenment. There we go. That, that's, that's a good way to say it in darkenment. Um, so anyhow, the, the Pontifex Maximus essentially was um, this, it was an actual pagan ritual, and these rituals actually were retained by the Christian Roman emperors, beginning with Constantine, and on through even into the 10th century AD, 
Wow. There are still rituals on the books by the Roman emperors. And this is, so this is, this is the type of false history that you get when you read about the Eastern Orthodox polemics against Rome. They'll keep on telling you, oh, well, Rome kept on increasing her power and increasing everything. But in reality, what was happening was Rome was increasing its power in reaction to the actions of the sacred emperor and his imperial bureaucrat, the patriarch of Constantinople, who he would just depose at will and add it, put a new emperor. So the greatest, for example, the greatest uh, Eastern Orthodox emperor, Justinian, yeah. he would just depose his own bishops at will. They were just imperial bu bureaucrats, basically. Have you, have you read this book? Procopius. Yeah, exactly. So Procopius is a, is a, he's a critic of Justinian and he writes this secret history, which is critiquing Justinian. He calls him basically, uh, his wife was dominating him. He was not really manly and, and all this, that, that that's what Procopius says. Um, and so that's an interesting text. Um, and, but people, Eastern Orthodox will not tell you that essentially they're, they're, uh, so much of what they believe was basically just imperial politics. They believe that it was just that the patriarch of Constantinople was raised to the equal equal C to the to the Roman C based on solely imperial grounds, and they they're just sort of ignoring the fact that there is this strong, either either a, a, an explicit Pontifex Maximus, like the even into the 500s, the the emperors were using the term Pontifex to describe themselves in official documents. And then they also have these rituals going in to the 10th century. But you see that Justinian, Justinian himself, even in the divine liturgy to this day, there's the hymn of Justinian, yeah. which is, uh, is, this is entirely orthodox. There's nothing wrong with the hymn itself, but the, the fact that he inserted something into his liturgy, into the very liturgy of the church, he's acting as a Pontifex Maximus when he does that. You, you don't have, you don't have a, uh, uh, the same kind of uh, insertion or, or as assertion to alter the liturgy based on a sacred emperor status uh, and that type of thing that, that influences things. So this is just a thread of the history, which is very, it, it's very ignored and this, but this is really a great deal of the, what happens in the East is that it gets more and more Greek. It loses its Roman character. And so as it loses, and Justinian was the last one who had Latin. They didn't have Latin after Justinian. He started legislating in Greek. Probably and so the, the Latin mind is lost. They still call themselves the Roman em Empire, but they don't have the Roman language. Now, in all fairness, the, the, the Carolingians and all sorts of Western powers, they also had their own issues. So I'm not saying the West was all uh, pious all the time either. But, but these, are the, these are the aspects of the, the Eastern West schism which are, those are the flashpoints. The flashpoints are, are happening at these little dichotomies where they are uh, trying to get power over the West based on these political ideologies and whatnot. So that was one of the biggest things that I, I didn't even see until now um, that's brought out by a number of different, um, a few different historians. Uh, there's a really great text that I relied on a lot so this this text is really good. Uh, do you know this one, uh, uh, Alan? This is so. This is um, uh, Mikhail Emanuelovich Poznov, History of the Christian Church Until the Great Schism of 1054. He's a he's, Catholic, right? Yes. So he's a Russian Catholic. Um, I think he died in er, like early 1930s or something like that. But because he fled the Bolsheviks, but he writes this history which is essentially arguing this, this same, the same point about the, the, the patriarch of Constantinople being a, an imperial bureaucrat basically. And um, I mean, this is also coming from the East, these, these Russians again, <laughs> coming to their senses a little bit and seeing, seeing the light here uh, d despite uh, transgressions against them by their Latin brethren. Um, but that was a, that was a big text for the, the book that I relied on. Well, um, um, I, 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 I kind of noticed in my own study that like, it starts off l l like I was kind of always uncomfortable. Like when you study the first millennium, the role the R Roman emperor played 
uh, it, it starts out with Constantine, like he calls the council, but he allows the bishops to essentially discuss, and he's like, okay, well, whatever you guys come up with, I'll, I'll publish it as the official the, the doctrine. But by the time you get to Justinian, he's running the show. Like he's telling the Greek bishops, okay, I want you guys to take the Pope's name out. And like, like I think the only r reason that council was such a scandal is Pope v v Vigilius was offering some opposition, you know? And, uh, but like, apart from that, everyone else was being like, oh yes, Justinian, we'll, we'll do this for you. And by the time you get to, uh, you get to Emperor Constans II. He's uh, he he's arresting the Pope. He sentences the Pope to death and Maximus the Confessor, but he commutes it to an exile. And and yeah, like that's the Pontifex Maximus at work. And like like like, like as soon as as after I saw your thing on race and theology, and I re read your book, it all made sense. All the pieces were together. It's stuff I've always known, but I didn't presented that way and um so yeah no that's good oh what's the name of that uh, book you just showed okay so this is um it's called a history of the christian church until the great schism of 1054 and uh, the author is mikhail emanuelovich poznov the uh publisher is author house it's translated by thomas herman um, so he was the professor of church history, at the university of Kiev, which was the Russian, Russian Imperial Ukrainian, uh, university. And then uh, later Sofia in Bulgaria. So, hmm. um, I don't know much about the man, but he basically, um, there's just like a short summary of, of his, um, his life. He was essentially his, his, he helped to found, okay. He died in Sofia in 1931. And he never finished, he never actually published this book. Um, but his his daughter, who was a part of the Russian Catholic um, dias diaspora, there was, um, helped to get it published finally. And so it's just a, it's, it's just a phenomenal work, which is lesser known. And he really just, it, he, and he's just very fair, I think, because there's just so many polemics in this issue. And, um, I, I, I tried to be fair with my own text, you know, giving as much, uh, you know, mea culpa on the Latin side, because there's a great deal of problems on the Latin side too. Um, but ultimately what defines our doctrines? That's kind of, that's the ultimate question. I mean, we've had great, great atrocities on both sides of the schism, but what ultimately is the deciding factor because in the East, the deciding factor is the Pontifex Maximus to this day. That's the why there's a formal schism between Moscow and Constantinople to this day. Whereas in the West, the ultimate deciding factor is the apostolic authority of St. Peter. And so it that's really, that's the bottom line, ultimately. Well, believe it or not, the thing that I'm about to tell you, it, it shocks a lot of people. But one of my favorite Eastern Orthodox saints is actually Mark of Ephesus because he actually like stood for faith while the Pontifex Maximus at that time, Emperor John the eighth is like, come on, we need to sign this. We have to get the crusade from the Pope, you know? And then he's like, no, it's, it, it, it's a compromise on the faith. We can't do that. And everyone else was like, Oh, right. Right. Emperor signed there. Okay. You know, there's my signature, you know? Um, yeah, so like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Until a century, fourteen fifty three. Um, I, I mean, at that time, I guess John the Eighth was technically doing the right thing. He was allying with the true Church, but let's face it, it was probably not for faith reasons. It was probably more for pragmatic reasons. You know, like save my empire. You know, um, both him and his brother Constantine the Eleven, but both sons Emmanuel the Second. Um, what surprised you the most, uh, when writing this book? Um, I, I was, I was very much surprised. Let me talk about Artemis Ephesia. That was a big thing for me because one of the things that really, actually, let me back up. Let me first say the first surprising thing was the Spanish history, uh, from, 
the Reconquista all the way into the Spanish Christendom of North and South America, which was destroyed by the American Empire. And that was the first surprising thing because I, I did this series with Luis Medina on, it was called Catholic Empire, the history of Spain. And it's really quite remarkable when you look at the history of Spain, how successful they really were at creating a, a Spanish Christendom based on a subsidiarity. It wasn't, it wasn't like any other empire in the sense of uh, most empires are, are very evil from the top down because they're very top down, but the, the, at least initially until it was very corrupted after the 1700s perhaps, but um, initially the Spanish Christendom was creating something um, that was very much just a continuation of the first Christendom. That, I think that was the, one of the biggest surprises in things was realizing that Christendom, as we know it, is often just confined to the so-called Middle Ages, another pejorative never to be used by Catholics. Don't say the term <laughs> Middle Ages. Uh, I use the term first Christendom or just Christendom, uh, you know, of the 13, 1000 to 1300 Western Europe. But realizing that that Christendom really continued on, it first continued on in Europe, in Spain, in uh, Austria and Italy, lesser to, to a lesser extent in France, but uh, in uh, Bavaria, you know, there's there's still this Christendom that continues on with this Baroque civilization. I never really knew about Baroque civilization until researching for this book. And uh, then there is the, the Christendom of the Americas, of course, which is just a continuation of the same Christendom. So uh, the church really triumphs against the Protestant revolt. It's really quite a miraculous triumph because the Protestant revolt was the worst crisis the church had faced at, up to that point. And really the church not only triumphed and beat back the Protestants, but gained ground back from the Protestants and then took it to the world. So that was very surprising. Um, but, and then secondly, I'll say another surprising feature was realizing that the, the crisis of Vatican one and Vatican two is far more complex than I, than I've heard any, most people talk about. Uh, in fact, oh, I don't have it with me, but um, a great text on this point is um, Henry Sear, Phoenix from the Ashes. Uh, he, he has a great, a very great text, very great text indeed, um, which really starts to admit the real issues that were at work before Vatican II, because it is a, one of the myths of the trads is that before Vatican II, everything was rosy and everything was great. Yeah. And the church yeah. was yeah. doing great and growing awesome, you know, and then Vatican II happened. And, but in reality, it was not great. Uh, I mean, it was very good. There's lots of good things, of course. But when you see the history a little bit better and more objectively and you see the issues that were at work before Vatican II, then you at least on Vatican II is actually understandable, at least why there was this reaction, basically. So that was surprising, and it's really opened my eyes to the fact that, happily, indeed, it's opened my eyes to the fact that there's a lot more to the story of Vatican II than just sort of the, the sort of the basic trad narrative. There's mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of truth to the basic trad narrative, but because they leave out these other parts, I think they expose themselves to criticism, unfortunately, and then the good points they make end up being dismissed. So I think that's one of the issues with a lot of sort of trad rhetoric, if you will. But I wanted to talk about Artemis Ephesia because this was the big, big uh, surprise for me because I never really realized it, and I was it was it was an amazing. <laughs> I was so I was so so happy to to find this out because we talk in America especially we we love Our Lady of Guadalupe and we love the story of Our Lady of Guadalupe converting the Mexicans and uh, you know really the Empress of the Americas and and she's such a central she's the a Western Hemisphere apparition. Period. She's she's it, and and we love her. And I I didn't never even realize that there was sort of a first apparition in a big way uh, that already did that in the Mediterranean world, which was the the conversion from Artemis Ephesia to Our Lady of Ephesus. And th it's remarkable when you when you read the Book of Acts. There's this chapter um, where. St. Paul is in Ephesus and there's this riot 
where he starts preaching and then they realize that they're losing their economy because they're making these several statues of Diana, who's Artemis Ephesia. And there's this huge riot over it. And you could trace the history. And I actually got this, a lot of this history from a researcher. And, and part of this is, is because a lot of this research is new because the shrine of Artemis Ephesia was destroyed and people kind of forgot about it, I think. Um, but I used one, a researcher who seems to be seems to be some kind of neo-pagan because he really loves this stuff and he seems to really love it a lot and which i don't like but he he dug up all these things of artifact part of his aphasia and he, he wrote about it and he wrote about her cult and everything all this stuff and and he and he re and he he actually m sort of admits that there are all these earthquakes that god sent to artemis aphasia to destroy the shrine and and god was basically kind of working in Ephesus to destroy this cult of Artemis Ephesia. And we know by tradition that Our Lady came to Ephesus. That's where she lived after um, the resurrection yeah. and the ascension of our Lord. And so she actually came to the epicenter of goddess worship of the entire Mediterranean. So the entire Mediterranean was worshiping this goddess Artemis Ephesia and come to realize Artemis Ephesia is actually a big feminist goddess these days because Ooh. she was a, this goddess of power and magic and feminists today especially those who are into the occult they get into artemis and she's a huntress and she kills men who offend her and it's very feminist so it's sort of this proto-feminist cult of this <laughs> goddess worship and our lady comes to ephesus and she's the one who destroys this this whole cult by her intercession, she she uh, there's a to my knowledge there's a dispute about whether she was assumed actually in Ephesus or in Jerusalem. There's a dispute about that, but um, eventually, it is the Council of Ephesus which enshrines the the dogma of the Theotokos in Ephesus. And this is comes after a number of generations. There's these earthquakes that destroy her shrine and everything. Finally, Saint Thomas, or I'm sorry, Saint uh, Saint John Chrysostom goes to Ephesus and despoils her, her final final remains of this shrine at the same time as he's battling against um, the, uh, you, what is it? Who is it? Eudoxia? I'm blanking on the name now. I think it's Eudoxia, uh, the, the empress who exiled him. Um, but she was actually, he was actually fighting against this unholy empress, but then her daughter is St. Pulcheria. And St. Procaria is this empress, this uh, Roman empress in Constantinople. And she's the one who really spreads Marian devotion. And she's very pious and very holy. And she's actually the one who calls the first crusade, in fact. The, the, there's actually the Heraclean crusade uh, later on with Emperor Heraclius. But St. Procaria is really the one who calls the first real, it's not called a crusade at that time, but it's the first military engagement, which is meant to defend Christendom. It's, it's called solely for the basis of defending Persian Christians actually from persecution. So there's not, there's not a, a goal here of, of uh, conquest, but it's a goal of Christendom. And so that was a very surprising aspect because we talk about, I talked about this Pontifex Maximus issue, but there's a beautiful thread within that, a Marian thread with um, Our Lady of Ephesus destroying the shrine of, of Artemis Ephesia and then St. Pulcheria really uh, embedding in the in the people of the East this strong Marian devotion, which we eventually see even more so uh, during the Sasanian invasion in the six in the six hundreds, when uh, the to the the champion leader is is uh, written the Akathist hymn comes out of this. So there's this beautiful Marian uh, devotion which helps to convert the the eastern roman society so those are some some of the things that i i found to be wonderful and fascinating and, and beautiful about uh god's working in history and, and converting wow. soul to society well no that's good stuff um i l l let's bring back to the uh 20th century here i got a question for you uh this comes courtesy of my bud sonic storm um was it the best decision for the neo-scholastics to go hard and strict on the camp trying to r revive patristics, racehorsement, 
in the early 20th century? Yeah, I think that's that's the real question, I think. Uh, was Gary Goulagrange, uh, because the, the big thing, I, this is coming out of Dr. Matthew Minard's lectures, which I'm sure you're familiar with over at Reason and Theology, because just for viewers, essentially, because this this is the complexity of Vatican II. This is, to me, this is the heart of it right here. The heart of it is that there is an effort to resource mall because we have all of these Latin texts and Greek texts, which are critical editions. We've never had these before. And not only that, even to this day, they're still publishing new editions of uh, Syriac texts, uh, Gehaz, Coptic, Armenian, etc. even further. So there's even, there's so much more research even to be done. And so the neo-scholastic school is, they're concerned about modernism. Now, it's very difficult because on the one hand, their instinct was absolutely correct because we know that among the resource mon nouvelle Théologie thinkers, there were modernists. There were just real bona fide heretics and modernists. Hans Kuhn. Yeah. Uh, you know, may, may he, may he, uh, hopefully he repented before he died. I mean, the, the man was a heretic. He divide, he denied all the dogmas. Uh, and this is the type of false resource ma which was mixing in with the true resource model. And so they, and, and even I've talked with people who are more knowledgeable about it than me, who are partisans of sort of the Nouvelle Telegie and partisans of Communio. And they say, yes, Gary Glergrange was correct in critiquing, uh, I think it was Bouillard when he wrote, where's the Nouvelle Tele where's the Nouvelle Telegie uh, taking us? I believe it was Bouillard. who was the one where he said a, a, uh, a theology that's not new is a false theology, or, uh, or a theology that is not current is a false theology. So Gary Lagrange, the best Thomas of the day, was actually putting his finger on something very important, and he was correct in putting his finger on that one thing. The problem was that there needed to be what what I what I talk about in the book is um, let's see what is that very <laughs> some Gary oh, yeah. Lagrange. Gary Lagrange. There we go. So. This is what I talk about in the book is the concept of via logos. And I use the, the Greek term because there's a nasty English version that's a perversion of the actual um, concept of via logos. Because via logos, D I A L O G O S, logos, it has the term logos in it. It means what Socrates did, which is you sit down and you debate it out and you figure out what's going on. But the problem is you need Three to words, actually. Right? What was that? Like through word, that's what yeah. it means. Yeah, dialogos, dialogos, uh, dios means through or penetrate or, or go through something. Logos is logos. So it's it's like a penetration of logos, a penetration. It's, uh, the English term dialogue is is not used properly today, shall we say, to the <laughs> to say the least. Yep. But Socratic dialogue, Socratic dialogue is, that is the answer. Socratic dialogue, not, not false dialogue, Socratic dialogue which is where Gary Guru Lagrange and the Thomas, they could actually debate everything out with the Nouvelle Theologie. And that's the only way you can weed out the chaff from the wheat, both the, the people who are chaff, because there's actually people who are chaff, like Hans Kuhn, got to weed them out, got to anathematize yeah. them or whatever. And then there's also just honest errors. I mean, that's just theologians make errors, honest mistakes, you know, and those just need to be weeded out. What, they're, what needed to happen before Vatican II was a restoration of the old rivalry of schools. Because at the time, Neo-Thomism, Neo-Scholasticism was so dominant that it was not able to have this healthy rivalry and healthy synthesis with other schools of thought. And it was because of modernism. I mean, they had clamped down on modernism so strongly for a good reason. But the problem is that they needed to form this synthesis. So I, it's a difficult question. I mean, I don't know if it would have been better if uh, Humani Generis would have been not issued so strongly maybe, or maybe certain figures, like they should have condemned Taylor de Chardin and Hans Kung and not other people like Ratzinger. I would say Ratzinger is far more sane and more orthodox. You know, if there's any issues with Ratzinger, I would certainly think that just mm. a... a an actual theologos uh, uh, working out the issues could could work those things out. 
Um, it's it's just like framing the here are the essentials of the dogma that we all need to agree on, and then we can debate about these other issues and figure those out. So I certainly think the debate should have continued because if the debate would have continued in the 1950s, I, I certainly don't think Vatican II would have been as as revolutionary as it was. And there wouldn't have been would have been such a suppression of Thomism as it was, and a, sort of an attack on Thomism as it was. There should have been a healthy debate with Thomism and and sort of this the new school of um, this Augustinian phenomenology. So it's a complex answer, <laughs> but I would say yes and no, basically. Yeah, to, yeah, to yeah. The original yeah. question. Yeah, no, it's uh, no, those are some some good qualifications. It's certainly not easy. Um, uh, what are you hoping to accomplish with this book? Um, I'm hoping to give the, the common layman hope, first of all, because a lot of people are losing hope in the church. And I think when we know our history a little bit better, we, we get, we get more hope because we know that our fathers faced, uh, they faced being drawn and quartered and being pulled apart, pulled, their limbs pulled apart, literally, and uh, being disemboweled and things like that. That's what they faced. And they persevered. And they the reason we have the faith is because they persevered in the face of that type of torture. So we need to just take a step back, look at our history, and that gives us greater hope because we are inspired by our fathers and what they did for us in handing down the faith. And secondly, um, I think... Like I said, I think there's a lot of false history. I think just a lot of people are relying more on slogans and ideology than the Sound actual right. history. Yeah, and and I think when we get in the actual history, we realize that there's even the greatest popes, people like people we revered, people like Trads Revere, like Pius the or Pius the Ninth. There, there's still significant issues that arose, I, and we're just in this very difficult time in the past 250 years. It's just constant revolution constant bloodshed uh it's a difficult time so it, it it makes sense that even good men will stumble or or fall into excess or just have a bad advisor and tell them bad information and act on it what can you do it's difficult so we need to just step back uh realize that things are a little bit more complex and then that helps us just debate these these, these issues and then get on with especially the the lay people, I think, I think my, my third goal especially is to really point out the fact that we are in a clericalist era in the sense that there's been a, there's been a, uh, there's been a breakdown of what's called the temporal and spiritual sword, which is falsely called church and state today, but that's not, that's not a correct term. It needs to be the two swords, the temporal and spiritual sword, which is the lay people and the clerics and there's one church of both the church is both and when pius the ninth did not invite lay rulers to vatican one uh emilie olivier the prime minister of france said that pius the ninth has decreed the separation of search and state and this is an issue because the there needs to be an organic uh mutual cooperation between the lay and the cleric. And this is completely broken down at this point. And we're at this point where bishops are just doing whatever the secular lay state tells them. <laughs> and they're not even Catholics. They're just, they're just bossing them around. Like and uh, yeah. So, so the, the, whereas the lay people, the Catholic lay people, um, they, they, the apostolate of the laity, I mean, let, let me put it this way. I mean, I, you, I do meaning of Catholic and I, laity are forced to shoulder the burden of the temporal or the, sorry, the shoulder, the burden of the spiritual order by becoming theologians. It is, it is an aberration for lay people to be theologians. It's an aberration for lay people to teach the Bible and teach theology. We don't want to do that. We just want to go t take care of our families and build a Catholic city, and, and mm -hmm. you know, get our guns out and defend the <laughs> defend against the Saracens or whatever. You know what I mean? 
it's the clerical office. It's their job to teach the faith, teach the spirit, do the spiritual sword. That's their job. But the lay people have been forced to shoulder this burden because unfortunately clerics, many of them have uh, just lost the faith or, or what have you. So another goal is just to restore a proper vision of what Christendom is and that it, it really is this organic unity between the lay and the cleric in one city, one city of God. And ultimately, I th in my opinion, I think that at this point in our history of, of this modernity, we need to begin to be to build Catholic cities to withdraw from the world and to start to build the Catholic city in some place and restore that temporal sword that, that we actually will wield as laymen, uh, as is our duty to wield the temporal sword. And the clerics can then wield the spiritual sword. And so these two swords can once again work together as they have been confused and uh, disunited for so, so much of the past 200 years. Um, I'm not saying every Catholic needs to go build a Catholic city. There's many Catholics who are in other vocational, but I think to a large degree, we need to just begin to do this. It's, it's, it's over. I mean, the liberal dream is over. We're, we're, we're done. Uh, it's, it's a complete failure. We need to move on. Yeah. Um, okay. So you talked about bad clerics. Now a question for you, who you think the church should suppress the Jesuits? <laughs> Yeah, that's a good. That's a that's a pretty funny question because because I I make a big deal out of the fact that the church suppressed the Jesuits in the first place, which in my view was pretty much the greatest tragedy of the post Reformation era. I'd say because at the at that time the Jesuits were the 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 front lines of the church preaching the gospel. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but but I guess I mean. I, I hate to take a stand on the Jesuits. I, I would prefer the Jesuits to be restored to their former glory um, because there would either need to be a suppression or there would need to be, it, it's just like the Vatican bureaucracy. The only way to fix the Vatican bureaucracy is to sack everyone. Yeah, and bring in your own people. That's the only way to do that. It's, it's completely, completely corrupt. <laughs> and what did they do during the Cluniac reform in the, in the 11th century? They just sacked everybody and, and took them out and, and just said, I'm just going to employ, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm elected Pope. I'm going to come to Rome with all my monks from my monastery and we're going to kick out everybody and my monks are going to take over. That's the only way. So, so in regard to the Jesuits, you would need to, there would need to be a, a coup d'etat, cut off the Jesuits, just take over the whole order and just revamp everything. I mean, but I, I, perhaps the Jesuits need to just die and we need to restore what God is creating with things like the uh, the Franciscans of uh, the Militia Maculata of St. Maximilian Kolbe, for example. Um, I, I'm very much into the Passionist Order. I think the Passionist Order has a, a strong role to play because the, of the conversion of England. Um, perhaps the Jesuit time has fast. I don't know. Um, okay. Now, um, again, slightly off topic, but also tangentially r related. Um, the, the, there's these r rumors in the last couple months that come up and then get quiet, then they come up again, then they get quiet of r restrictions on the Latin mass. Do, do, do you want to comment on that or? <laughs> sure. I mean, uh, just all you got to do is read Ratzinger. I mean, I, the more I read Ratzinger, the more I'm, I'm, I'm confident that this is, they're just, they just can't do anything. I mean, you just read Ratzinger and he essentially says, it, he basically implies that Paul VI was absolutely wrong in suppressing. He was absolutely wrong in suppressing the, the Latin mass on principle, not on prior res. I, I think when we argue this based on Pius the, the fifth and quote mm -hmm. premium, that's the wrong way to argue it. Yeah. The reason is because we have better reasons than Pius the fifth. We have even, even higher reasons than that. It's not even about a prior pope. It's about the basic principle of tradition, and and Ratzinger enunciates this. He says, when this is a, this is coming from Milestones, his memoirs. He says, when Paul the Sixth suppressed, in so many words, he says, when Paul the when Paul the Sixth suppressed the old mass, 
he introduced a breach. The English translation says a breach in the liturgical history. It's never been happening before in the history of the, of the church. And he said, this is just nonsensical. It's completely, uh, it's just uh, completely against tradition. And so I think if we argue based on quo premium, it's, it's less, it's less convincing. I mean, that may be true. We could, I could just grant you that, but there's even deeper reasons. There's a reason, there's a reason that Pius V did not suppress the liturgies that were 300 years old and older because he, yeah. he, he believed he didn't even have the authority to do that. That, he, that was beyond his authority. That, and that's the, that's what Ratzinger basically argues. Yeah. Ratzinger argues that all the six went beyond his authority. And now, so, now, yeah. Well, well, the, the, the thing that's so weird about all this, there's no document from Paul the six saying that mass is suppressed. And Pope Benedict said that in some more pontificum, but like, Although there was no document saying it was suppressed, it was a century suppressed. Let's be honest. You know, de facto suppressed. There was there was a reason it called they called it the indult mass. An indult is an exception to a universal law, so it was suppressed de facto. Paul the Six even said it's a it's a law. He said it it was a law in a universal audience, so it was definitely a law. It was lawfully suppressed, quote unquote, just because they didn't technically do all the juridical, canonical, whatever decrees. Maybe you can make that argument, which is what Benedict said, but it was, yes, definitely de facto uh, de suppressed. So uh, I, I know you uh, don't have a lot of time, but you got the time to take a, a couple questions from our yeah, viewers. Sure. Okay, yeah, sure. so viewers, um, so please put some questions in the chat. And w while you do that, I'm going to ask the question I think everyone is w wondering for me to ask. Mr. Flanders, what is the release date on the book? <laughs> well, it was it was going to be, I think, October 15th, but I think it might be uh, further down the line now because we've just had more editing to do. So I, I don't know, actually, at this point. It could, last I heard it was October 15th, but it might be pushed back to like November. But God willing, by Christmas, uh, you'll be able to buy it for Christmas. It, it'll, it'll make for a good story. Uh, talking stuffer that's for sure yeah no like i'm excited there's a, a few good catholic books that are going to um uh t to come out this year that i'm excited for i know that eric ibarra and more by um our good friend w w william albrecht oh actually. Um, oh yeah yeah two great authors right there for sure yeah no amazing there's some good stuff coming out this year the the, the catholics are having a good year uh, can and could Tim recite the Hail Mary in Arabic? That's up to you if you want to no, do it. No, I can't recite the Hail Mary in Arabic. I uh, learned the Aban al um years back, but I've lost most of my Arabic. I, I cannot speak it very much, and I um, well, uh, lamentably have lost most of my Arabic. Okay, yeah, and uh, if you, you, you go check our past shows, I have a... Uh, a talk with Tim about how he, uh, he, he talks about how he was in Egypt trying to evangelize the, um, Muslims or Mohammedans as he calls them. <laughs> and, uh, okay. Are there any questions? More questions? Looks pretty empty. If not, I'll, um, do, do, do you have any final words, uh, for us before I kill the stream? Well, um, I think the, the most important point of my book is that this, the, what has united our fathers from the beginning, from St. Stephen, is what I call in the book the crusading spirit. And the crusading spirit is the same sort of this, this fighting spirit that St. Saint Paul talks about when he says, to fight he talks about all these fighting me metaphors and that the is armor, the yeah. yeah yeah the the armor uh fight the good fight of faith all sorts of things like that there's so much military language and the the crusading spirit is what we need to restore and the crusading spirit is what it's really what meaning of catholic is is devoted to which is uniting catholic against the enemies of holy church and the first and foremost enemies are the world, the flesh, and the devil. And if you are not waging constant eternal war against the world, the flesh, and the devil, 
you should not be getting on the internet and telling people what you think or your opinion or whatever, or, or even worse, bad mouthing your brethren and, and running your mouth off about X, Y, Z, this, this bad person here or slandering this person or calumniating this person, because we're ultimately in a spiritual struggle. And if we can restore this crusade to its proper crusading spirit, where we're, we're no longer fighting, we're starting our fight against the world, the flesh, and the devil. And then, and only then, can we begin to resist the Marxists and the heretics and the liberals or whoever, whoever else is flesh and blood living who's an enemy. We need to raise the stakes because the reason we're losing this battle is because we have lost the crusading spirit and we begin to fight each other. And once we start to fight the real enemy, then our, our, our war can be focused where it needs to be. Because right now the devil's just laughing at us because he can get us to just fight each other, especially with this evil thing called social media. So my, my hope is that the book will inspire men of God to arise from their slumber and fight this truly good fight with great joy to lay it down our life for our brethren. And, and, and who is our enemy? The world, the flesh, and the devil is the first enemy. And after that, the enemy is what is called in the book, this is from John Rao, uh, the grand coalition of the status quo. The, the grand coalition of the status quo are essentially all of the heretics, Muslims, liberals, Marxists, Masons, communists, whatever, Jews, whoever else wants to simply maintain the status quo of their power and not be converted to Christ. And then the way that we fight those enemies are by converting them with the gospel. Wow. Well said. Well said. That's the, that's the best... Uh... <laughs> you are a straight shooter, Timothy. You know, God bless you. And and thanks again for for coming on. Um, yeah, I, I, I look forward to your book, and I think everyone in the chat is as well. Um, so, yeah, so uh, possibly October 15th. It might be delayed a bit, but around that fall time, we should... Um, we should be seeing y your book on the shelves. And... Um, yeah. So I'm just going to kill the stream. Thank you for coming on, Timothy, and, and God bless. My pleasure. Always a good time. Thanks, Alan. Bye.